The skill that I broke down was the triple jump. And triple jump is a track and field event in which each athlete, after a running start, makes three consecutive jumps for a total distance that's measured from the board to the closest mark in the sand pit. The athlete lands after the first phase on the same foot used for the takeoff. After the second phase, they land on the opposite foot. And after the third phase, they land on both feet or onto their side into the sand pit. The first phase is the hop, where the jumper must land and take off from the same foot that was used in their takeoff from the board. And the goals of the hop phase are to achieve distance, conserve the athlete's horizontal velocity, and to position the athlete's body to execute the next phases correctly. The athlete uses a push-like movement pattern by jumping off just one leg in the hop phase. This uses all the joints in the kinetic chain of the hips, knee, and ankle all in one single movement to create a higher force production and to increase their impulse momentum relationship. The hop phase consists of a forward movement of the thigh once the takeoff from the board is complete and much of this forward movement of the thigh is an elastic reaction to the stretch reflexes that are created in the hip flexors. And as the athlete displaces during takeoff, the hip flexors stretch and then rebound, and from the stretch initiates the thigh movement. And the ability to create this force via the stretch reflex, especially at the takeoff, um, is essential to the performance of the athlete. And the leg that doesn't make contact with the ground is first brought to the front of the body with a bent knee that ends up reducing their moment of inertia. So a greater horizontal velocity can be achieved and then this is carried through their next two phases. The second phase is the bound or the step phase where the jumper must land on and take off from a different foot than was used during the takeoff from the board and the hop phase. The goal of the step phase is to continue to achieve distance as well as to continue to conserve horizontal velocity and to preserve their posture going into their next phase. And the movement of the free leg in this phase is used to counter the forward rotation of the pelvis and a common mistake in this free leg Part of the phase is driving the knee upward rather than driving the thigh forward and this creates the body's flexion reflex which results in hip flexion that introduces a pelvic misalignment and the alignment of the pelvis is critical in the posture that's found in bounding the pelvis should be aligned in a neutral position with the rest of the spine and in triple jump, the pelvis acts as a sort of rudder of the body, which determines the ability of the athlete to create flight in each phase. And landing efficiently from the hop phase must incorporate a drive into the bound or step phase. In the same way that landing from the step phase, the athlete must be pushing off in order to prepare for the jump. Uh, this allows the athlete to maintain their horizontal velocity throughout the three phases. The third phase is the jump, which is just a simple bounding maneuver. The goal of the jump phase is to achieve distance, conserve horizontal velocity, and to position the body uh, for an effective landing. Success in this phase comes from performing the prior movements and phases correctly, so that the jumper arrives in a position to execute this correctly. And maintaining composure is important when completing the jump phase, as it's actually very simple to execute, but athletes often anticipate the completion of the jump and have a tendency to compromise their posture and mechanics. Some overuse injuries that occur from triple jump include stress fractures of the shin and foot, Achilles tendonitis, and lower back injuries. These can occur in any phase and lower back injuries are especially common in triple jumpers from a lack of the absorption of the shock at the landing of 
each phase found by Riley in 1977. Some acute injuries that occur from triple jump include hamstring strains and tears as well as meniscus tears. The connective tissue structures such as ligaments, tendons, fascia, they all must be strong enough to withstand the forces they're subjected to as there are also internal forces generated during the phases of the jump. And meniscus damage in the last phase of the triple jump may result from landing heavy if the affected leg undergoes any sort of rotational torsion when the knee is flexed upon landing. The biomechanical risk factors leading to Achilles tendonitis include decreased non-weight bearing, ankle dorsiflexion with the knee extended, and also increased non-weight bearing ankle dorsiflexion with the knee bent. The risk factors leading to stress fractures include ankle inflexibility, a decreased bone density, athletes making adaptations to certain types of footwear that they may have, um, having a difference in the length between their legs and then muscle weakness and imbalance in the strength. It was found in 2002 by Romani that increased pronation is common among athletes with stress fractures of the lower extremity. The risk factors leading to lower back injuries include a reduced range of motion in the trunk, muscle weakness or imbalance in the core and lower back, and reduced flexibility in the hip flexors and back muscles. And the core of the athlete's body must be capable of kind of harnessing and controlling the torques that are created by the limbs as the athlete moves through the three phases and also during their landing. The risk factors leading to hamstring strains and tears include a muscle imbalance or weakness of the hip flexors and also the quadriceps, and a decreased flexibility of the hamstrings as well as pelvic tilt or misalignment. The hamstrings are functioning to decelerate the extending knee prior to the foot strike and to assist in the extension of the hip joint after that hip uh, foot strike. The risk factors that lead to meniscus tears include laxity of the knee joint, instability of the ankle, and an imbalance between the quadriceps and the hamstring strengthwise, and stabilization of the joints of the takeoff leg is created by the isometric muscle contractions in the extensor muscles of the leg. These contra contractions are developed during the flight phase prior to foot contact and enable the leg to withstand the impact of landing without buckling. A lateral hip and glute strengthening program could be used as an intervention that would help to maintain a posterior pelvic tilt to increase stabilization and to increase the range of motion of the hips. An anterior pelvic tilt introduces instability and without stabilization of the pelvic muscles during sprinting and during the approach run of the triple jump. The hip flexors would tend to pull the pelvis forward, which limits knee lift and range of motion. And this would end up minimizing the elastic force generation, which is important for running at higher velocities. The removal of stress and loading is the main intervention for stress fractures, as well as for tendonitis. Crutch walking is preferred over casting because it allows the athlete to still be weight bearing and participate in non-stressful exercise. And then pneumatic splints are being introduced to reduce tibial loading and to provide support around the fracture site, as well as hopefully to reduce the length of the rehabilitation process. And athletes are encouraged to try to maintain their level of fitness as best as possible to allow for a quicker return to their level of practice or competition. Quadricep and hamstring flexibility can help to decrease hamstring and meniscus tears 
a muscle balance between the agonist and antagonist muscle group is desired due to a possible increased risk of injury that is a result of a muscle imbalance. A higher hamstring to quadricep strength ratio would represent a greater balance and particularly what's looked at is the hamstring eccentric to quadricep concentric ratio which should be looked at due to the higher quadricep moment that is observed during knee extension. So the recommended ratio for this is 1 and this is seen as a point of equality where the eccentrically acting hamstrings have the ability to fully break the action the concentrically contracting quadriceps. So during fast knee extension and towards full extension the eccentrically acting hamstrings have been shown to reduce this breaking moment that's equal to or greater than the extensor moment exerted by the quadricep and this was found by Agard in 1988. So this helps to reduce any anterior displacement of the tibia on the femur and to prevent hyperextension of the knee.